typically, of course, about government tenders that go out, private sector, um, you know, can can do their own thing. But when it comes to government bids, I would like to see, um, you know, more aggressiveness in terms of when those international interprovincial trade agreements are, are uh, you know, renegotiated, that we have a better edge there too, because, you know, we can't keep, um, you know, allowing government to put out tenders and having companies from uh, Quebec and Ontario and elsewhere uh, coming and doing the work that we can do right here at home. So I would like to see some adjustment there. And we have uh, had that discussions with government in the past on that too. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, there's been quite a bit of discussion uh, during the campaign, uh, especially by a couple of the other leaders on the potential for small modular nuclear reactors. What is the People's Alliance position on that? I'm very excited about uh, SMRs and, and the uh, opportunities that are there for those. Um, I think it could be uh, in many ways a game changer for New Brunswick. I support it wholeheartedly. And uh, I guess I can tell you that I would do anything that I can, uh, especially you know, if we're fortunate enough to stay in a minority situation after September 14th to push for that and to ensure that, you know, that becomes a reality here at home. Okay. Um, next question uh, is centered on something that's, that's really important in terms of population growth, and that, that is the issue of immigration. Um, uh, do you feel that the current system is working in terms of our ability to retain people, especially those that come in under the business stream? And, and what do you see as the role in the future for immigration in New Brunswick? Well, immigration is, is critical, uh, clearly, to population growth in New Brunswick. I mean, we all know we have an aging demographic. Um, <clears throat> our citizens are getting older, and some of our younger families are leaving, which means less uh, opportunity for future growth um, with, you know, obviously raising kids and, and a new generation coming up. So immigration is critical. And, you know, I think of even the, the system of the temporary foreign workers and, uh, you know, every season we bring in immigrants to work the fields and to do other uh, jobs. And then after so many weeks, we, we you know, uh, basically revoke their ability to stay and uh, back they go to their, to their country. I would like to see more of those folks uh, come and stay <clears throat> and help provide assistance to the, the, the needed labor force here in New Brunswick. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it, it really is about bringing in uh, new people and people with skills and, uh, and experiences and investment, you know, to help grow the New Brunswick economy. I, I don't believe we can have the success that we need without a, you know, considerable uh, uh, immigrant strategy, immigration strategy. Um, Mayor Michael Bryan of Fredericton asked a question in a couple of the other sessions that's, that's critical really, especially for the, the three larger cities and, and really for a lot of urban areas of the province, and that is around homelessness. Um, uh, certainly Fredericton, Moncton, and, and St. John, I think, are, are hit by this in their downtown right now. Um, and there are side issues of uh, addiction and mental health that are factored into this. What do you think is the best approach to solving this challenge? Well, yesterday we had the opportunity to be in Moncton uh, as I'm preparing for the CBC leaders debate here today. Uh, yesterday we come down to visit the Harvest House, which is a, a, a not-for-profit organization that helps uh, homeless people. And it's an incredible program, uh, not just for homeless people, but really people with addictions and mental health issues. It's an incredible program. They have uh, multiple properties now that they own in the Moncton area. We had the opportunity to tour them. They take people with addictions, <clears throat> give them some processes to help them get through their addictions, but not just, uh, you, know, you, you know, you have different um, groups that help with addictions. But what I like about Harvest House, it really takes it from the start to the finish. It invokes uh, training and skills. Um, you know, they renovate those homes that they purchase by, by the people that are part of the program. So it helps them uh, get reintegrated back into the workforce as they overcome their addictions. Uh, mental health is a huge issue. We also uh, visited uh, the Atlantic Wellness Center, which is just down the road from Harvest House there in Moncton. And they deal with uh, children with mental health issues well, and, and young adults from the age of 12 to 21. And it was interesting to see that one nonprofit group 
um, is at the front lines at, at early on to prevent a lot of the addictions that come from mental health issues. And then you see the back end of Harvest House where they're helping people that uh, didn't get, maybe did, didn't get the help from places like Atlantic Wellness uh, to help them get through their addictions and, and carry on as a, as a good citizen of, uh, here in New Brunswick. I had a lady yesterday as we were touring uh, come up to me that moved here from Alberta because of our low COVID numbers, her and her husband both have health issues. But then her second issue was they can't find a place to live. And I'm not going to um, and, uh, tell her, I'm gonna tell her the same thing that I, I will tell you folks here today. There is no easy quick fix to this. I mean, government could throw in millions of dollars and build new apartments and homes and, and get people into them. Uh, but then you have to maintain and uphold, you know, uh, make ensure that those places stay up to code and all the work that goes in the money and investment it would take. What I would like to see is, again, it gets back to taxation because if you can lower and eliminate the double tax, you're going to see more investment from developers in New Brunswick. And when you have more developers, that means you have more properties. And like any market, uh, you know, when you have more availability, prices tend to go down. And when you're not overtaxing those properties, prices tend to go down. So I think it, it's going to take time. It's not something you're going to fix in six months. But over, you know, two to three years, I think we can see uh, if we if we eliminate these ridiculous taxes so that developers will actually put properties up here. And, uh, and, and like I said, we'll even freeze, we'll even legislate a freeze on rental rates if needed to ensure that some of that tax reduction does trickle down to the tenants that are paying the rent until the market's able to correct itself with more uh, properties coming up into New Brunswick. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I'd like to ask a question on, on natural resource development. Um, it seems that New Brunswick has struggled in recent years in getting buy-in or that social license to move forward on things like natural gas development or mining or maybe the Mar Maritime Iron Project in Northern New Brunswick. What natural resource development do you think is most uh, critical for New Brunswick's future and how would government play a role in moving that forward? Well, we are certainly open uh, to uh, industry and resource development. <laughs> As I said, <clears throat> in the past, we have uh, supported the pipeline coming through. It only made sense to us uh, that uh, oil shipped through a pipe is safer than, than rail and, and purchasing it from other countries that, you know, uh, obviously have their own issues. So we supported the pipeline uh, in terms of natural resource development. We've always said if it can be done environmentally, uh, you know, uh, sound, if it can have uh, proper royalties so the province is getting a benefit, you know, then we would certainly support natural resource development. In terms of shale gas, um, we did uh, support uh, a legislative change to allow uh, shale gas development in the Sussex region. And I was hopeful that by lifting that moratorium in a localized area, that uh, developers would come in and, and continue uh, their exploration and, and development in that area so that the rest of New Brunswick could see that, you know, as, uh, as these developers come in, that, that the sky is not going to fall here, uh, that, uh, you know, it can be done right and done reasonably uh, safe uh, with environmental checks and balances, and that the province can make some money off it. My only concern at this point really is more related to the royalties and, uh, and, you know, whether now is the time uh, to do it, I, I don't know. Um, I would have to look at the numbers on whether it's, it's the best bang for the buck, because as you know, you know, the shale, that the gas that's in the ground, uh, it's not renewable. So once it's gone, it's gone. And I would like it to, uh, to be a part of a, a, you know, a climate, a market climate where we can get the best bang for the buck in, in its extraction and again to ensure that it's done safely that all the the the, the t's are crossed and the i's are dotted so it's uh, it's a it's a proper uh, proper job your your party has talked during the campaign about the importance of food security um i'm curious as to what you mean by that and how people's alliance would promote that um covid has certainly you know uh, made us more aware of our vulnerabilities when it comes to the supply chain globally and and especially you know it's it's one thing if you say well I can't you know I can't buy uh, 
a, a TV at a reasonable price because the supply chain's been, been messed up because of COVID. It's another thing to say I can't buy, uh, you know, a bag of carrots or, or vegetables because the supply chain has been, uh, has been you know, disrupted. So what I've learned from that is when it comes to food, we need to be self-sufficient. Now, clearly, if you're talking potatoes, blueberries, uh, maple syrup, apples, you know, there's certain things that New Brunswick produces that we're never going to run out of. Uh, it'll always be available here. But there's lots of other areas where food is not available. And we rely too much on other areas to provide that food. So when I talk about food security, I'm talking about year-round greenhouses, uh, giving more incentive and programs for the agriculture, agriculture sector to be able to farm. Um, you know, and there's no reason. I mean, New Brunswick has some of the most fertile soil in the country. And uh, we have real opportunities in my riding of Fredericton Grand Lake all along Majorville and Sheffield. Uh, beautiful farms there and, and opportunities there. And, and I mean, flooding is an issue. Um, but if, if we can find ways to work around that to ensure that uh, those farms can, can operate and, and flourish, it's important. But I do think year-round greenhouses also have a huge impact and localized year-round greenhouses so that communities uh, and entrepreneurs can rise up uh, from the private sector to provide those year-round greenhouses. There's all kinds of ways of doing it. Technology has advanced uh, significantly over the years and I think it's a great opportunity to tap into that and, uh, and be self-sufficient when it comes to our food supply. Okay. Um, as I think everyone knows, uh, New Brunswick, like most other jurisdictions, has gone deep into the red uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, the Liberals are promising a balanced budget by 2023. What uh, is your approach to restoring fiscal balance in New Brunswick? I've hammered home for years uh, the need for balanced budgets. And I've always said that in normal times, government should not be running deficits. So if that means changes have to be made to programs, if certain programs have to be eliminated, so be it to get those books balanced in normal times. Clearly, uh, this is not normal times. And it's times like this where I think the, the worry about balanced budgets for at least a short term does need to be put aside. Because if, if all of our goal is now to balance the books, uh, first off, it's, there, there's no way you're going to do it. Uh, it's a false promise. And secondly, uh, if you did do it, uh, look out because the cuts would be major. I mean, next year, government has uh, numbers which are conservative numbers, small c conservative, uh, at $399 million deficit next year. Scotiabank had it as high as $1.2 billion deficit next year. So that's massive. I mean, that's huge. Either way, even the $400 million is a huge deficit. And, and it, it, it was very disheartening for me because I worked so hard uh, over the years to push the message of balanced budgets. And for, you know, we were able to pass balanced books. Uh, the first year we were in, we were very pleased to, to sit at the table with government to work on that budget to ensure it was balanced. And uh, I was happy to take part in that in balancing and, and but COVID changed all that. So I believe government's got to pull out all the stops. Um, you know, it's always important to be fiscally prudent. We don't want to just throw money uh, out the window, but uh, times like this, we have to ensure that the cuts and the changes aren't so deep in an effort to balance the budget that uh, it has the opposite effect long term. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question which uh, Krista asked in one of our, our previous sessions was obviously the, the business organizations that are sponsoring this series are, are most uh, involved with private sector growth. How would the People's Alliance ensure that decisions of government are always made with a business lens? Mm -hmm. Good question. And, uh, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that I believe uh, private sector can flourish in a free and open market that has as little government uh, interference as possible. And uh, I know uh, the Green Party has been promoting a $15 minimum wage. Uh, those of you that operate small businesses know full well the impact that will have on your bottom dollar. And, and I understand when you say uh, $15 minimum wage, it sounds great in theory. And, and I do, I sympathize with people that have to, you know, raise a family on a minimum wage income. I, it, it would be incredibly uh, difficult. 
But on the flip side of that, if, if we were to put the minimum wage at $15 an hour, uh, the small business that has 10 employees is going to go down to seven, which is going to raise your unemployment across the province. And the seven that are left are going to do the work of the other three. And that's if the business can even stay open, because a lot of businesses that I've talked to said if the minimum wage goes up to $15 an hour, uh, they're closing up shop. So we have to be careful uh, with that. And this is what I mean by government interference. I think government has to be reasonable about what they expect from businesses. And uh, again, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think a lot of it goes back to taxation. I think if government can get to a place where the government can operate in a smaller, more efficient way and, uh, and uh, reduce its expenditures and ensure that, that uh, the money that is invested in economic development is invested towards tax reduction so that all businesses can have a fighting chance. I think we'll close the Q&A session with, with this last uh, point, uh, Chris, and we put this to the other leaders. Um, please take a couple of minutes and answer the question of why you, why the People's Alliance, and what sets your party apart from the other four major parties as best able to lead the province? Well, as you know, uh, New Brunswick has been governed for 100 years under majority rule. One party has made all the decisions. And there are some people that would say, you know, that provides stability. Uh, but I would dare say that New Brunswick is in the mess that it's in currently, um, you know, is because uh, one party has made all the decisions. There's been nobody to pull them back when they make bad decisions. There's nobody been there to push them forward uh, to make the decisions that are beneficial to, to the people. So, you know, in 2018, we, we broke that, um, that majority rule. We, we, we had a minority government. Um, I do believe it's disingenuous uh, for the PCs to claim that, um, you know, uh, we're at an election because of instability. It wasn't unstable. The numbers were still there. Uh, myself and Mr. Kuhn was willing to work with the PCs to find that middle ground to move forward. Um, but they refused. So I would stress that minority governments work. Um, and I do believe stability can be had. And, and we, I guess as a party, what I would say to your members is during the first year and a half, when the numbers were there, the People's Alliance worked towards that stability. We provided that stability, but we also provided accountability. We did not give the government a blank check and we didn't uh, pass everything they wanted passed. And that comes back to the checks and balances. And I mean, it's simple. If, 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 if majority governments, which have ruled us for 100 years, work so well, New Brunswick would be in a much better position. Uh, but I do believe that if we can continue the minority governments uh, with us at the table to ensure that balance is there, I think New Brunswick would be better off for it. Great. Thanks very much for that. And, and thanks very much for your time today with us answering these questions. It's, it's valuable content for all of us to, uh, to mull as we uh, decide uh, you know, what's important to our organizations and obviously on September the 14th. I'd allow, uh, like to turn the mic over to my colleague at the Fredericton Chamber, Krista Ross, who's going to close this session and the series of five sessions that we've co-presented. Krista? Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks, John. And, and thank you very much, uh, Chris Austin, leader of the People's Alliance, uh, for taking part in our political leader series and participating in the Q&A. Um, this session, as John mentioned, was the final installment in the political leader series. And we were so pleased to have uh, five provincial party leaders present to the business community through this series over the last two days. It's really important for the business community uh, to hear from the party leaders and in particular as it relates to the party positions on issues that impact the business community because we know that whatever impacts the business community ultimately impacts everyone. So our thanks to you, Chris, this morning, uh, also to Kevin Vickers, Blaine Higgs, David Kuhn, and Mackenzie Thomason. And I want to remind everybody that these sessions have been recorded. They are going to be posted to our social media feeds uh, of the host organizations. And we invite all of you to review them and also to share them. As we close the series, I want to thank the guests who attended not only this session, but any or all of the five sessions. And I remind everyone to get out and vote. Um, I'd like to extend a big thank you to the teams from the three presenting chambers uh, here in Fredericton, also Moncton and St. John. 
and a thank you to the Atlantic Chamber as well for their support, and as well the three presenting economic development agencies, Economic Development Greater St. John, Ignite Fredericton, and 3 Plus. So thanks again, Chris, for this morning, and thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Krista. Appreciate it.